right, we're in the book of Philippians, going through Philippians. We're in chapter three today, and I want to challenge you uh, to go home this week and read the entire book. It's only four chapters. It's really short, uh, but next week, Destin will finish chapter four, so I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, the title of the sermon today is Raison d'Etre. Raison, actually, it's d'Etre. Uh, this, uh, my uh, Cajun French is coming out right now. Uh, with that understanding, and it, it means in French, the reason for living, your purpose for life. It was interesting, I was reading a survey this week, it was actually done in Sweden, but it was an international survey uh, for millennials. And what was interesting is um, they asked the question, what is your biggest fear in life? Of course, some people said the usual, you know, death, <clears throat> not having a job. There were different things, sickness, things of that nature. But the number one answer, more than anything else, which was really pretty surprising, was that millennials were afraid that they would live a life without purpose, that they would never find their meaning for life. Now, if you don't believe there's a God, uh, if you don't have a, a worldview that's inclusive of God Almighty and the uh, scripture, then your basic purpose is existence. And that's why most people live. And so you just try to seek pleasure, have fun, whatever, because I, I don't really have a primary purpose because there is no God, there is no creator, uh, there is no definitive purpose or reason. So it's existence. But as believers in Christ Jesus, Paul makes it abundantly clear what our meaning is, what our purpose is. And this is what Paul tells us in Philippians chapter three. He says this, he says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Have you ever gone to a place, maybe it was a place that you thought, I, I don't know anybody, maybe it's a big work party or you had to go out of town or you find yourself and you're in this situation where you're going to go somewhere and you're kind of dreading it because you know you're going to walk into a room full of people that don't know you and don't care. And at least that's your thought. Have you ever had that situation? And what does it feel like when you go into a place like that, that you've got a lot of apprehension and you think nobody knows me, nobody wants to talk to me, nobody's, I, I just feel completely awkward. What is it like though when you go and you see somebody that you know and they smile and they invite you to come over and you begin to talk to them? It's just an incredible experience when your expectation is, I'm not going to be accepted. And someone accepts you. And it changes your whole view of the situation because you know somebody. Paul, in effect, is saying that. You can know somebody. You can know the person of Christ and Christ alone. And you can know your purpose, your meaning in life. And it comes through Christ and knowing him and making him known. So as we read through this section of scripture, this chapter, chapter three, uh, we're gonna see kind of uh, two bookends. One, Paul's going to address some folks that he's really upset with because they believe in Christ plus, Christ plus the law, Christ plus the tradition. And he's saying, no. Do not buy into that. Do not go that direction. Don't fall into this legalism. And then at the end, he's just going to briefly reference uh, kind of this spirit of Gnosticism, of Greek philosophy that is tainting the church, that's coming in with some folks that says, hey, if you believe God, if you have a relationship, you're great. You can do whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. Just go do whatever you like doesn't matter. And Paul's going to address in the middle, hey, this is what it means to, to live for Christ, to know Christ. Now, there are three important doctrines I think we ought to understand for us to fully gather and fully uh, assimilate 
what Paul is talking about in Philippians chapter three. And I wanna give you three very important doctrines, uh, three words that you probably hear sometimes and we don't always think about what they mean. And I think this is a good background. Uh, Paul's addressing these issues, though he doesn't call them these doctrines, he doesn't name them, this is what they are. The first one is called the doctrine of justification. Justification, what does justification mean? Justification, as we're talking spiritually here, is a one-time event where we are saved from the penalty of sin. In other words, when you trust Christ as your Lord Savior, when you remove your trust from anything that you could do to what he's done, that at that point, you are justified by the Spirit of Christ through his righteousness. In other words, God applies the righteousness of Christ Jesus to your account. God sees you as righteous. It's as if you were an unknown child that he didn't know to one that he has adopted and fully embraced. So justification is we are saved from the penalty of sin. It, it's not a continual, I don't have to continually be justified. Uh, I, get, I, I need a little bit more justified. Again, it's, think of it as you've been a, a, adopted as a child. You can't be more adopted. You don't do things to make yourself more adopted. You are adopted. You are the child of that family. So that's what's transpiring here. We have been justified through Christ. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. The second one is this, sanctification. We hear this word sometimes. What does that mean? It's the process of being saved from the power of sin. The process of being saved from the power of sin. We don't become perfect when we become a believer. Matter of fact, uh, the reformers said this. They said, simul justus et peccator. Simul justus et peccator. What does that mean? It means simultaneously a sinner while being a saint. In other words, I've been adopted. I'm a saint. I'm a believer. I'm a child of Christ but I still struggle with the power of sin. There are things I still struggle with, but as I grow in the spirit of Christ, as I begin to learn and read and place the word of God in my life, as I begin to pray, as I begin to fellowship with other believers, that I begin to grow, I am going through the process of sanctification and I am gaining power over sin. The spirit of God is nourishing me with his spirit that I might not be ruled by the power of sin. That's sanctification. That's an ongoing process till we die. The third one is this, it's called glorification. And that's when we will, be, we will become from the power, of, from the presence of sin. In other words, we will be removed from the presence of sin. No longer will sin even be an issue or even exist once we are glorified, once we die and we go to be with the Lord, Christ Jesus, then we are in that perfect state and we are transformed. We receive a glorified body. So justification, I'm saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, I'm being saved from the power of sin. Glorification, I will be saved from the presence of sin. All right? Understanding that, let's look at Philippians chapter three, beginning with the first verse. Philippians chapter three, beginning with the first verse. And Paul is writing here to the Philippian church and he starts out and he says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. He uses this word 16 times, joy or rejoice. He said, look, I want you to rejoice in the Lord and to write the same things to you now is no trouble for me. I want to reiterate this. There is reason for it. There is purpose for it. So I'm going to say these things and I'm glad to tell you again, I want you to understand the pure gospel. And I want you to look out for the dogs, look out for the, the evildoers and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's talking about a group called the Judaizers who say that Christ is not sufficient. Christ alone is not enough. In verse three, Paul says this, for we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What is Paul talking about here? Well, he's saying, you know, I know there are those that are coming and they're saying, particularly you Gentiles, the most important right of a Jew, of a Jewish boy was circumcision. It was the identifying mark that we are a different people. We're a chosen people. And so it was the most important ritual a boy would go through. And he's saying, don't put confidence in that. 
those who are not Jewish, those who've not been certified. That's not it. It's in Christ. He is our circumcision. He is the one who has identified us and marked us by the power of his spirit. And verse four says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in his flesh, I have more. Paul's saying here, look, I know a lot of people will tell you, this is what I do. I give, I share, I help, I'm nice, I'm kind, I pray, I go to church, I do all the festivals, I do all the traditions, I do all the things I'm supposed to do. I've studied hard, I am a good person. And they list their resume of how good they are. You ever had somebody, ever talked to somebody about this? You know, sometimes when I share my faith, I'll say, there's a diagnostic question uh, that I went through some training. It said, you can ask people, hey, if you stood before God and he said, why should I let you in my heaven? What would you tell him? And most people will say this, well, I try to be a good person. I, I, I believe in God. I try to be good. I try to help people. I, this is my favorite one. I've never killed anyone. Uh, <laughs> there's our bar, you know. <laughs> and they kind of go into their resume. Here are the things I've done. I try to be good. I try to be kind. I try to be nice. I try to help. And we start listing our achievements. And Paul is saying, no, it has nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do. You can't earn your way. You don't deserve. There's nothing you can do. So here's what I want to tell you. Look, if you're looking for confidence flesh, you think you're really good. You think you're the mother Teresa of your neighborhood. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you what I have done. And so he goes on and he says this, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's the first day a Jewish boy could be circumcised. I was first in line. I was there. I was there on that day of the people of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. You know, there were 12 tribes. 10 of them uh, decided to go their own way. Only two of them followed the Davidic dynasty. It was Judah and Benjamin. Ju Benjamin would be the smallest tribe. It's where their first king of Israel came from. Saul was called from. It's where Jerusalem is. There was a lot of national pride. If you're a Benjamite, you are a true Jew. And he goes, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I've got the pedigree. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a pure Hebrew. My mother was Jewish. My father was Jewish. And as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. I have my doctrine in the law. I am studied. I am well acquainted with the law. I have taught the law. And as to zeal, I'm so passionate. I don't just teach it. I don't just talk about it. I go out and do it. That's why I was persecuting the church. That's why I was trying to tell, tear this whole Jesus thing down because I not only believed it, I was, I was just going to do something about it. And so I had the zeal. I was a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. I kept every law, kept every sacrifice. I was always there for the feast, for the holy days. I kept all the laws. I mean, I was pretty much perfect. But now look what he says in verse seven. But whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. What is he saying here? He's using an accounting term right here. He said, all these things that I had for gain on my resume, all these financial positives, all the things that were on the right side of the book that were, uh, so to speak, uh, this was my earnings. This was my cash. This was my life. This was my success. He goes, I've now moved them over to the debt column. They're in loss. They were profit, but now they're loss because they were keeping me from Christ and I was depending upon them. And Paul deals with this sometimes. If you're, maybe some of you are like me. I, I grew up in a, in a great church, but it was a very uh, conservative, fundamentalist Southern Baptist church. And, uh, and that's okay, as long as you don't think uh, that all the things that you do make you a Christian. But I kind of fell into that. And matter of fact, sometimes like when I'm pushed or shoved, I'll kind of fall back to that legalism. And Paul probably struggled with that too. You know, I, when I get pushed, I'll just think, okay, I'm not gonna uh, drink, uh, dip or chew or date girls that do. And you know, and you kind of get into that <laughs> mentality that this is holiness, that this is good Jesus stuff here. And Jesus is saying, no, it's really not. Uh, not impressed. Paul's showing all the things that he accomplished. 
All the reasons you would think he's a good dude. If anybody deserved to be there by the law, Paul said, it was me, but now I count that as a loss. That is a hindrance for me. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. There's a purpose. There's an, in Christ alone. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as crap. Hmm, somebody's offended now. <laughs> you know, I've never used that word in church. Well, last service I did. I, I've never used that word in service. But the word scubalot, it doesn't just mean rubbish. As a matter of fact, it is a strong, offensive term. It's meant to get a re- just kind of a revolting uh, mentality or response. It is a, a response, it is a word that uh, would have been a four-letter word in their culture. And so he uses it here. We don't see it in the Bible again. We don't even hardly see it in Greek literature because they didn't talk like that in Greek literature. But Paul uses it here. I want you to know all this stuff that I've done it's dung, it's fertilizer, it's poo-poo. That's what he's saying. Do you get it? I mean, and they would have gone, whoa, that's the opposite of what we think. Like that's a strong statement. He goes, yeah, I want you to hear it. I don't want you to forget it. Just like I said that word in church. All right, you could have even used another one. In order that I may gain Christ, I have to see my accomplishment. What I've done is dung in order that I see my need, that it's Christ and Christ alone, in order that I may gain Christ. Now, the reformers really help us to understand this. There's something called the five solas, and I wanna share those with you, even though a couple of them we're not really talking about. Uh, But the reformers came up to help uh, understand what does it mean to serve Christ alone? What does it mean uh, that we put our faith and trust in Christ alone. Well, one is sola scriptura, which means that scripture is our final authority. In scripture alone is our final authority. That doesn't mean we don't have spiritual leaders. It doesn't mean we don't have pastors and those kind of things. But at the end of the day, our final authority is the word of God that God has spoken. And because here's the problem, all men and women are fallible. I'm fallible but the word of God is infallible. In other words, I make mistakes, God doesn't. And so with that understanding, that's why scripture is the final authority, sola scriptura. The next one and what we're talking about here today is sola Christa. Sola Christus, Christ alone. Jesus has accomplished everything needed for our salvation. When we talked about justification earlier, And we said that the penalty was removed. Jesus did that. And there's nothing I could do to make that happen other than to receive that grace by faith, which brings us to the next, the third sola, sola gratia. Sola gratia, which is grace alone. I am saved by Christ alone as I receive his grace. I can't earn it or deserve it. I can't make it. It's grace, grace alone the granting of salvation that is from God Almighty. And I do that through sola fide, faith. I receive the grace through faith alone. Salvation is granted by those who put their faith and trust in the perfect work of Christ. Not in your deeds, not in your efforts, but in what Christ has done. Then that brings us to the purpose, the divine purpose for which we exist. Sola Deo Gloria. I live to the glory of God alone. The chief purpose of mankind is found in the glory of God. Scriptura, my authority. Christus, my Savior. Gratia, the grace that has been given to me. Fide, my faith that I transfer from what I could do, from stuff that I've accomplished to what Christ has done then God is glorified. Those are the five solos. Those help us to understand what does it look like? What does it mean? How do we live out our love and our commitment to Christ and Christ alone? We have two extremes, don't we? Some people think, you know, you you still earn it. 
it's still by being a good person. I was reading Michael Bloomberg a few weeks ago and I was just, I go, man, there's a picture of what most people think and what most people believe. They were interviewing Michael Bloomberg and <clears throat> they were asking about some of the things he'd done and you know, what makes him do the good that he does. And he, he told him, he said, you know, I just gave $50 million for gun control in New York City. So I, I did that, you know, and a couple of years ago, I gave over 50 million uh, for the ocean and to clean up the ocean, clean up the environment. And I've, I've done some other environmental, I've, I've spent over $150 million I've given away uh, so that citizens of this great land, of this great city uh, can have, you know, have a little health and can protect our world. He said, I'm telling you, I've done a lot of good. I've given so much, I've done so much. If there's a God in the heaven, I tell you what, when I get there, I'm not checking, I'm going straight in because I've more than earned it. I deserve it and I know that for a fact. I've, I've done all I should do and much, much more. It's not, matter of fact, he goes, it's not even close. You look at Paul and what he was saying. All these things I've done. And then I look at this, and if you're like me, I'm going, well, what if you don't have $200 million to give away? Does it, what does that do to the rest of us? I'm not even close. Do you have to give that much away? Do you have to, what would he do? And Jesus addresses that, addresses that with a rich man who came to follow me. But he left because he had too much. And he said, I want you to lay it all down at my feet. It looks like Jesus was saying in the gospel, and Paul is saying, it doesn't matter how much you have. It's in Christ alone. That can be a hindrance to you. You can think that and you will, you will believe a false gospel. The two, true gospel is we only give because of what he's already done for us. Not so he'll do it. But that's how most people think. Paul continues here in Philippians chapter 3. And he continues this motif and he says this in verse 10. I received the righteousness from God depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I may know the power and the strength of the resurrection and may share in his sufferings. I may be willing to suffer if necessary for the sake of Christ. I want to be a part of that. When I see people hurting, I want to get in there and I want to suffer with them. I want to be with him. I want to empathize. I want to help. And becoming like him in his death, in all humility, he gave his life. Though he could have had the power to take, take their lives, he gave his life up willingly that by me, any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained this. He talks about sanctification here now. And am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. I've been saved from the penalty of sin. And I'm not saying that I don't struggle with sin anymore, but he says, I'm being saved from the power. I, I continue to press on. I continue to seek and pursue Christ. And he says this, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind me. I am forgetting my accomplishment. I'm forgetting what stood between me and an almighty God, my works, my rights, that I deserved it, that I had earned it. I am forgetting what lies behind me and straying forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call God in Christ Jesus, that is my prize. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to the salvation, to the grace, to the faith that we have been given, that we have attained through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he said, but jo brothers, join me in imitating and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example in us. And now he talks about another group. We talked about those who were legalistic, who would find themselves uh, trying to say, I've earned it. It's Jesus plus all the things that I do. Now he's going to address a group. It's called the Gnostics. Uh, he's addressed them on and off. And they're basically people who take a very Greek philosophy of life, uh, what we would call hedonistic. Hey, Hey, make sure you, you believe in God. 
you have your God, whoever that is. But what you do here on earth, what's your body? Your body is basically just flesh and evil. You can't do anything about it. You, you just do whatever feels good. If it feels good, do it. Hedonism, pleasure. Your pursuit, your reason is pleasure. It's what a lot of people believe. It's what a lot of people live. That I am not here uh, simply to exist. I, I, want, I want pleasure. I'm not here just for Christ. I want pleasure. And he says, there's a group that's telling you, oh, you believe in Christ? You can do whatever you want. Live however you like. And he goes, for many of whom I have told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And here he explains their philosophy. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with mind set on earthly things. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame. They're proud of their sin. And with their mind set on pleasure, he's saying, flee. Hey, don't fall into that. I, I believe in God. I'm good. I'm covered. I got fire insurance. I can do what I want. That is the same thing as when you uh, have a child and you commit to raise a child and you come to the place where you just don't worry about it. Just do whatever you want. Maybe you abuse them. Uh, maybe uh, you're destructive in your behaviors and you think, hey, doesn't matter. I mean, I still love them. Yes, maybe I'm abusive. Yes, maybe I'm a bad father. Yes, maybe I'm a bad mother, but I love them. That's all that matters. Well, it does matter what you do. And see, love manifests itself in how we live and what we do. That's how love is manifested. It's more than just a word or just a feeling in biblical terms, certainly. So every once in a while, I, I've had this numerous times, people will make horrible choices and I'm trying to get them not to. And they go, well, I'm just gonna do it. I mean, I'm a Christian, God will forgive me. What, before you got married, said, now look, I wanna marry you, but I'm gonna have multiple affairs. I'm gonna see other people. I'm gonna do whatever I want, but I love you. We good? <laughs> if you have any sense, I'll go, no, we're not good. And you, you don't love me. You, you're coming in, you're presuming upon the mercies and upon the commitment, then you really aren't making a commitment at all. You really don't love at all. And Paul's exposing this heresy. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. My citizenship. You know, when P Jesus was before Pilate, he goes, are you a king? He goes, I, my kingdom is not of this world. I basically have come to bring my kingdom to this world. And that's what Paul is saying here. You're a citizen of another kingdom, of a heavenly kingdom. But your responsibility now is not just, oh, wait till I get to heaven. But we're to bring heaven to earth through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the hope of the gospel. And finally, Paul says this, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Remember the doctrine of glorification. Our bodies will be transformed into a glorious body, into a perfected by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. And then chapter four, verse one, Destin will preach this next week, but he says, therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. Stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the gospel. Don't let yourself be pulled away by legalistic Christ plus things that you think make you holy, make you saved. At the same time, don't, don't disrespect, don't dishonor if you truly love Christ. Live in a process of sanctification. Don't live in a manner that he is uh, disrespected, that makes Christianity, that makes his kingdom look like it's hypocrisy. When we love someone and they love us, 
We don't keep doing things so they'll love us. We do things because we love them. If we can ever understand that mentality, I serve Christ, I love Christ, I worship him, I serve, I do things. Great to do all the things that I do, but because of what he has done for me, not so that he will do it for me. Completely the opposite. I was reading uh, some articles on Ernest Hemingway. Uh, we were over in the Keys uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, the time before, I had the opportunity to go to the Keys and see Ernest Hemingway's house. And, uh, you know, some would say he's arguably the uh, greatest novel writer in American history in the 20th century, anyway. So, I had some, you know, great books. I mean, you, most of us had to read uh, The Old Man in the Sea. Uh, from Whom the Bell Tolls, um, A Farewell to Arms, multiple books uh, that he wrote in short essays and stories, a powerful writer. Uh, but what's interesting about Ernest Hemingway, his, his background, he grew up in a very fundamentalist, legalistic background. And his parents, particularly his mother, were very, very rigid, very legalistic. And so uh, while he had prayed and professed his belief in God, he just found it so hard to perform all the rules and do everything that they ask. And as he got older, he started to realize that he just couldn't. And it felt so oppressive to him uh, because he was trying to gain favor of his parents and of God. He kept feeling like, I, I gotta get God to approve me. I've gotta get God to love me. And so it just became so harsh that when he moved away, he kind of quit attending church. His mother would send him letters. You better be in church. And he'd go, I, I still believe. But finally, he just got to the place to where he began to write some books and his parents greatly disapproved. The first book that he wrote, they sent it back because they felt like it was so worldly and sent it back to the, to the, um, to the uh, publisher. They told him how disappointed they were and they told him that multiple times. And finally, he just came to place and he goes, hey, this doesn't matter, I'm, I'm gonna punt. So he started living uh, the most hedonist, hedonistic life he could. He sought adventure. Uh, he was married four times. Uh, they said he had, probably had over a hundred affairs. He um, lived in France. He lived in Italy. He lived in Cuba. He lived in the Keys. Uh, he lived in, matter of fact, he, when he died, he lived in Idaho. He lived all across uh, the land. He got into, uh, he made millions of dollars. He was very wealthy. Uh, he was a, a big game hunter. He would go over to Africa and hunt big game uh, he was a big fisherman, uh, ocean water fish. He would go out to sea and catch these huge fish and put them up. Um, he even decided to be a uh, bullfighter. So he went down to Mexico and he was doing bullfighting. If there was an adventure he could do, he would take it. And he just lived in that manner. If it felt good, do it. If I feel it, I'm gonna do it. And so he just lived that out. But he became so depressed and discouraged and toward the end of his life, there was a quote from him that he said, you know, I feel like life is just this. We are ants on the end of a burning log with no hope and no future. Hemingway went from one extreme, legalism, to the other extreme, hedonism. And eventually, this great talent would take his own life. That's why scripture, that's why Paul is saying salvation and meaning come from Christ and Christ alone. Don't settle for a false gospel. Don't settle for the world's mentality of hedonism and that life is all about pleasure. It's about being known by Christ and making him known. That is the purpose that you exist. And that's why we are to glorify God. So we do that as a reminder. Let's go back through five solos and solas in today's language. Our salvation comes Christ alone through Jesus. By grace, we are saved through faith, not of our works. It's through our fide in what Christ has done. We are grounded in scripture for the glory of God. Have you done that? Let's pray.
Father, thank you for the great gift of Jesus. We don't have to earn our way. We don't have to work our way into salvation, that it is a gift of grace that is given by you when we put our faith in you and take it off ourselves, take it off what we think we've done or could do and put our faith and trust in you and receive the grace of justification. One time event that we are forgiven, that the righteousness of Christ is applied to our account and that we now live out a life of thanksgiving to you, Jesus, for what you've done, for what you've given, for all that you are. We are being sanctified from the power of sin. Until that day, we experience the glorification when every sin will be wiped off of the earth and we will live in a perfect and pure state our Savior and Lord, and all who have chosen to be a part of his family. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, I pray that you would draw them by the power of your spirit today. For those, Father, who've fallen away and said, I, I got Jesus, I'm good. Lord, would you remind them that the gospel is in Christ alone. Grace through faith, the authority of scripture that we are to live to glorify you. If we have another purpose, then we probably don't really know you. Let us not be deceived by the enemy to go to either extreme, but let us rest in the perfect shalom peace, the salvation of Christ and Christ alone. We thank you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.